Um, so my name is Sasha and I'm the geologist and educator for the Waitaki White Stone Gear Park. So welcome everybody, it's good to see you all here this evening. Um, last year we ran a series of public talks, we had one a month and they run for an hour of various topics covered by different experts. Um, and this is the very start of um, our public series talk. Um, for the year this evening. And so we had uh, Nick and Kamaya here from GNS, um, up from Dunedin. Um, I'd like to say a little bit more about himself soon. He's a, he's a geologist and he's one of the uh, key players in the um, information that's out there about Zealandia. So Zealandia is the story that we tell the formation of the continent of New, of New Zealand that New Zealand sits on is Zealandia. And it's upon that story that all of our other stories rest. So it's really fitting that we launch this year's talks with this topic. And um, so welcome and thank you for coming. And um, we will have questions at the end. If there, if you have a presentation, what we're next speaking on a particular topic that you'd like um, clarified, Nick is happy to take a question in that moment. So, I'm Oh, thank you for the introduction, Sasha. Yes, so um, I'm Nick Mortimer. I'm a, been a geologist with GNS Science for 35 years, uh, mainly based in the Dunedin office. And um, it's nice to be invited back this year. Um, last year I talked in the library about the continent of Zealandia, as Sasha explained. Um, and we, Sasha and I, uh, debated what, what could I talk about this time. Well, we're going to talk about Gondwana and how the supercontinent of Gondwana relates to Zealandia and how we can see this in, in the story of the, the local rocks that are in, in the Waitaki Geopark. The Gondwana story is locked up in rocks called Greyraki and Schist. And as it turns out, uh, these are the rocks that I first started working on when I came to New Zealand in 1986. And I've always been working on them in the background. Um, most of my talks these days are on Zealandia, so it's nice to be able to give a talk on Greyraki and Schist as, as well as Zealandia and, and its implications. So my talk's going to be broken into four parts, really. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about where you can go and see Greyraki and Schist up the Waitaki in, in, in the Geo Park, and what we can make of it just by looking at it with our eyes uh, and, and where it is. Uh, the middle part of the talk will be a bit more specialised, but, but hopefully I, 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 I've pitched it so you, you know, your interest is maintained, and that is how the mineral zircon um, tells us things about schist and greyraki that we can't see with our eyes. So this will be going into the laboratory. I'll take you into the laboratory at Otago University and show you what we do with the mineral zircon and how that's informed us about Gondwana in, in the schist and greyraki. Then the next part of the talk will be about continents and supercontinents. Uh, Gondwana, Pangaea, Zealandia. And finally, the last few slides, I'll, I'll bring all of those three strands together just to, 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 to finish off. So a bit of a warning, uh, I'm going to be challenging, challenging you tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to get you thinking about time and space like a geologist. Now look at the top bar here. Um, most of us just think in terms of a human lifetime, all right? We, we go back and the further back our childhood memories are less good than our more recent ones. Then we have history, more than 10,000 years ago, archaeology. And you, you know that geologists talk about tens and hundreds of millions of years as if it was last week or last year. <laughs> that, that, that's how we are. Um, to to most, most people, geology is, is, is just right down the back end there. But to a geologist, we, we, we pull things out and think, think more linearly. So, we are going to be going back in time today. I've been, I've been talking like a geologist, hundreds of billions of years. And this is the time at which we have these continents of Zealandia, Gondwana, Pangaea. And this is the age of Goraki and Schist. 
So that's why we're going back in time. We're going back into deep time to understand the Bible. There's not only time, in, uh, I'm going to be going up and down in space as well. Okay. Um, this is a little diagram that I drew for a rock and mineral book a few years ago. Here we have the Earth on the outside, continents in brown, mountains, rock formations, actual hand specimens of rocks. Then down at the millimeter nanometer scale, we have minerals and even atoms. Okay. So we span, you know, thousands of kilometers to get, to get the big picture of how the Earth works. But in order to see the big picture and understand it, we need to go down to that atomic level. And that's where I'll be taking you into the laboratory um, in the middle part of the talk. As an aside, the, the logo for GNS Science there is meant to represent this um, span of space. You, you can look at that logo and think of satellites circling around, orbiting around the Earth measuring gravity and doing geophysics. You could think of it as a murky boulder, being being sliced up, that that big. Um, it could be a, a forum, a micro fossil, about a millimeter wide, or it could be an atomic nucleus with electrons going around it. So that was specifically designed with that in mind. And we'll be going up and down the scale as well. So the first part of the talk then, um, very wacky and schist in the Waitaki Geopark. Well, as I'll show you in a minute on a map, there's a lot more of it there than you might think. It, it, it underlies all of the hills and the mountains. If you scratch under the soil, you can find schist or Greywacki. You often see it in road cuts, in the dam abutments, and also in the river gravels. Every, every pebble and cobble and grain of sand in, in the Waitaki River uh, is actually just a, a piece, a small piece of Greywacki or schist that's been eroded off the, the mountains and, and is now heading out to sea and out into the Bounty Trough. As we look up the river in this panoramic view by, by my colleague Lloyd Homer, very simply, uh, on the north side of the river you have Greyraki. Greyraki is a, a kind of a, a typical Canterbury rock. And on the south side of the river you have Schist in Otago, and of course Schist is almost synonymous with a taiga because the, the provincial rock. Um, you see it at its best in, in central Otago, um, but nonetheless the, the, Hawk, the back of the Hawk Gun ranges here and over the Gantis Pass are, are schist as well. So that's as, as simple as you can get it. There's, 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 there's plenty of these rocks in view here. So what are they? Well, they're very unlovable rocks actually. <laughs> Um, they're grey, they're hard, they're stony and bony, all right? Um, in fact, most geologists don't, don't study them. They, 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 most geologists have interest in the limestones and, and, and younger things or active faults. But uh, this is a picture of these rocks I've got here. So a, a grey wacky is uh, a hard, muddy sandstone, and you can those of you close, you can see this kind of sandy texture. So this is just like, this is a lot of solidified sand, okay? It's gone really hard because it's so old. It, it's got locked together and cemented. And it's a classic sedimentary rock, so-called sedimentary rock. Uh, schist is also grey and hard, but it does split, okay? So uh, this is why it's useful as a building stone, a, 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 a facing stone. And um, it can split very easily, and it's black and white, not quite so grainy as this. Uh, the white is quartz, the black is a mica. And this is a classic metamorphic rock. So these are the hard rocks that un underlie um, the, the soil and, and, and the younger limestones and sandstones and gravels in the, in the Waitaki Valley. So here's that geology map. Here we are in uh, Omaru, um, Pura, Omaruma, up there, and down here it goes far south as Ranthurley. So this is a three color map. So everywhere that's white is fairly young rock, um, 100 million years old or, or younger. And this does include uh, limestones and, and sandstones you can see around the place. And these tend to occupy the low valleys. 
as you can see if you get your head around the geography here. So up the wide, broad valley as far as Kirao, Akataramiya, uh, up in the Mackenzie country, and um, the Manyatoto and, and these other basins here. So these are the, the young rocks that are filling in holes, if you like, in the, in the ground. And you can see the, the uh, grey rocky is in blue colour and the schist is in purple. So that, that photo I showed a couple of slides ago, looking up the valley, most of the grey rocky is, is to, to the north in Canterbury, and most of the schist is to the, the south. All the black lines are faults, geological fault lines, where things have gone up and down, have been shuffled and jiggled, and that means it's not a really clear cut north south pattern for the schist and grey rocky. They're a bit mixed up. But by and large, that's what we see. And I'll put the number here, 200 to 300 million years old, Triassic and Permian. And you'll see where that comes in a bit later on. So, yeah, plenty of this stuff around. And you go further afield to the scale, and we're going from yeah, 10 kilometer scale to uh, 100,000 k scale, and the national geological map in the same colours. Uh, you can see they're, they're quite widespread throughout New Zealand. The grey rocky in the blue colours. It occurs down in the Catlins, uh, all through the, the uh, Canterbury foothills. Every rock you see on the Wellington coast is a grey rocky. The backbone of the North Island and then scattered uh, bits in, in north of the Eden. And the schist also forms this, this belt, a very wide down here in Otago, narrow in the Alps, bit in Marlborough. There's a tiny one pixel size bit of purple there, <laughs> Cape Telefiti, west of Wellington. And then, then we see it in the Kaimanawa ranges there, the Kaimanawa schist. And we also see schist on the Chatham Islands, as, as well as Grey Rocky. So we can draw, we, we geologists like to draw lines and correlations and link things up. So we can quite legitimately link up Chathams with Otago, track it through the other side of the Alpine Fault, up under Wanganui Basin to there. And even if we take a deep breath with a broad brush, there are shifts in New Caledonia as well, that are the same age and, and the same material. So we could even take that purple line out of the kilometers to the north through Zealandia if we wanted to. Some of my colleagues say that uh, Grey Rocky, because of this, all the blue on here, Grey Rocky should be regarded as New Zealand's national rock. <laughs> They're probably not wrong, actually. So how are these two related? Are, are they related? They're both grey, they're both hard, but in fact they are um, quite intimately related to each other. They, they occur next to each other in the Waitaki Valley. In fact, schist is simply grey wrecking that's been squashed and recrystallized through heat and pressure uh, down in the Earth's crust. I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but it doesn't, looking at these three samples held in the hand here, it doesn't take too much uh, imagination to go from this rock to this rock if, if you were to squeeze it like that. That's, that's where you get to this um, splitability. You're literally putting pressure there. Uh, at surface temperatures, you try and do that to a rock, it would, it would fracture and break. Um, down in the crust, rocks become ductile, and you can actually, they actually flow like coffee if you squeeze them slowly enough, but, but relentlessly enough. And so you go from this to this, and another step with more heat and more pressure, you start to sweat the quartz out of the rock. It, it recrystallizes, and so you get these black and white bands. But this, the shift started off white as it goes grey rocky. So they're, they're, they are related to each other. Now, where are the best places to go to see these two rocks? Well, the anyone, anyone who recognises where we are here? Benmore Dam. Benmore Dam, that's right. So, uh, one of the best places I know of to see Grey Rocky uh, exposed reunited is, is, a, is along this um, strip of shoreline that leads to the Waitaki River here, just opposite the spillway. And this is a favourite place for Otago University to take its students on geology field trips. And you can see why. There's all this marvellous uh, grey rocky here. The grey rocky is, is the pale grey colour. 
and I should have mentioned a couple of slides ago, the companion rock to grow rugby is argillite. argillite. So grow rugby is a sand, hard sand, argillite is a hard mud. Sand and mud, they kind of mix up and sometimes they're separate and sometimes they grow into each other. This shot here, there's a lot more argillite down here and a lot more grey rugby back in that bit there. And it's very steeply dipping, it's just kind of pointing down into the earth, so it's being, being tilted around. And you can go get your nose on it, you get a bit closer, there's a 50 cent, 50 cent coin here, if they still exist. Um, and you can see that they're interbedded, they're interlayered with each other. And those, if there's any geologists in the audience, you can actually see graded beds in here. But the, the sand kind of grades into the argillite gradually here, then whoosh, there's a very sharp base to this sandstone here, and that grades up into that, and then there's another sharp contact. So there's structures of information here, and also the, the cracks, these joints that are going across. Um, it's all useful information to geologists to build a picture of the history of the, of the Grey Rocky Rock. They're nice and simple and parallel there. In other places, on that same platform, they're a bit more uh, munched around. So here there's been a bit of faulting and folding, and the, the Grey Rocky beds have bent into um, folds, and they've been, been cut off and, and sliced off by faults. So there's something for everybody, there's something for sedimentary geologists, there's something for structural geologists, and as I'll show you in the middle of the part of the talk, there's something for, for um, the Zircon people too. So that's great, I think. And one of the best places to see just is here at the Dancers Pass Holiday Park. <laughs> or any spots along the Dancers Pass Road or in the Marofanoa River, okay, where you can get down there. And when you go there, um, down to the river just below the holiday park, this is what you see. Uh, at, at face value, it looks pretty similar. There's all these steeply dipping surfaces. So it's standing on end like that. Okay. And you get a bit closer. And yeah, it's greyish. But there's, um, here, there's a lot more quartz. There's all these quartz veins and there's lots of little white um, Quartz sheets and veins riddled, riddled through it. And if you get it really close, you can see it's not really like the, the black and white, very rocky and argillite, because that heat and pressure has recrystallized the whole mass. And so things have got a bit more mixed up, and the quartz is starting to sweat out of the, the argillite bands. But, you know, despite the, the recrystallization, you can still see what used to be mainly a grey rocky bed here and, and a darker argillite one there. And another lighter grey rocky, and that's exactly what you're seeing. So, that in a nutshell, um, that's what we can see with grey rocky and schist with our own eyes. Okay, so the geologists of a century ago, when they were coming through to do the reconnaissance mapping, finding out what, okay, where's the coal, where's the limestone, where's the other things. Then they recognise grey rocky schist and put it on the map, like I showed. But there's a limit to what you can do and find um, without laboratory work. Okay? I should have mentioned that there's not many fossils in these grey rocky. They're, they're, they're scattered around, they're, they're not very pretty, uh, they're, they're hard to find. So, in order to um, get more information out of the rocks and kind of understand what they can tell us, uh, we need to go into the laboratory. And this is something that really dominates geology these days, is, is, is laboratory work. And I'm going to give you a taste of, of some work that my, my colleagues have done um, in you know, torturing <laughs> grey rocky and schist in order to yield up their secrets. So the first, first step in this is to look at grey rocky and just under a microscope. So instead of just with your own eyes, um, look at it under a microscope. And when you do this, uh, this is a typical view here, this would be a few millimetres across, and Adam here is looking at a grey rocky, and you can see the sand grains in it. I said it was a hard sandstone, and there you are, the, the white grains in there are quartz, and there's feldspar and lots of other things packed in there, and it's all cemented up nice and hard. 
So that, that's why it doesn't can confirm it is a sandstone. It is what we think it is just by, by looking at it. So what we're after these days, a lot of us are after these days, is, is a mineral called zircon. And zircons, yeah, you may have heard of zircon. Zircon is a gemstone, um, all right? Uh, chemically, it's very simple. It's a zirconium silicate. That's a relatively simple chemical formula. It's a fairly hard mineral. Most have a seven and a half. And what makes it useful to geologists is that it's very resistant, both chemically and physically. So you can't abrade it very well. If you, if you put zircon in the river, it'll last the whole trip down to the, mount, to, to the, to the river mouth. Okay? It's not going to get any smaller. Everything else crumbles away and the micas get smaller and, and, and turn to mud. But the zircon will, will always stay there. And likewise, when you heat the gravity up and turn it into schist, the original zircons stay there. Right? They're very chemically resistant and physically resistant. And because it, because, because it hangs around, that's one reason why it's very kind of useful to us geologists. You can always see back to the, to the original rock that it came from. Zircon's fairly rare. Um, we're talking about sand grain in size, bits of zircon here, not, 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 uh, not the gemstones that you find in rings, okay? So we're just talking sand grain size. And another reason why it's useful for geologists is because we use it as our so-called geochronometer. A, a geological clock. And that's because this is a simple chemical formula, but you can stuff some uranium in the zircon, but no lead. And then using the equipment that we've got around these days, um, you can measure amounts of uranium and lead. And many of you will have heard of radioactive decay. Um, some elements decay naturally to other elements. Well, the uranium and lead is, is, is a well-known pair of elements. Uranium is at the start of the, of the uh, reaction, the nuclear reaction chain. Lead is right at the end, there's lots of elements in between. Other ones are potassium argon, rubidium, strontium, radiocarbon dating, all operate on the same principle. Well, the half-life of this um, reaction is, is about the age of the Earth. So, um, put simply, uh, Today, we only have half of the amount of uranium-238 on the planet that we did when the Earth was formed, mm -hmm. right? The rest of it's turned to lead-206. And we geologists have put this to great use, as I'll, as I'll show you in the next few, few slides. But the first thing we've got to do is get the zircon out, out of the rock. And that's actually no trivial thing. Um, we put a lot of effort into this so-called mineral separation. First of all, uh, we can actually do a scan. This is the bottom slab of that, that bit of grey rock I've been holding up. So in, in, in normal light, a sawn slab here, it's just a, a hard grey rock sandstone. Put it in the ultraviolet light, there's a few grains will fluoresce uh, an orange colour. Of course, you can see this much better in a dark room, and they're very tiny. But uh, nonetheless, we've got one at least on a good sized one on this slab here. So the zircon is making its presence known because we're putting ultraviolet light on it. So that's encouraging. We know that, that, that rock's worth crushing up and trying to work with more. So something that size, about a kilogram of, of grey uh, We've got labs up in lower huts, jaw crushers. We'll crush it, but to turn it back into a sand, basically. Okay, that, that's really hard and tough. We crush it and sieve it, put it through sieves, and so um, it's back to an original loose sand of um, 0.1 to 0.25 millimetres. Okay, so a very fine sand consistency. What we do then is put it through what called heavy liquids. Water's got a density of one, right? There are, there are liquids that have densities of uh, 2.8, 3.3 that we use quite regularly. What that means, if you, if you put all that sand in water, it'll all sink, because all the minerals are more dense than one, right? Um, but uh, if you put it in a 2.8, the quartz will float. Look, it, look, it, it, it sounds remarkable, but it's, it, it's, it's a neat thing to see. But you, you pour some sand into it, a jar of this liquid, and, and half of the grains float. And then, uh, because zircon is very dense, zircon's got a density of about four, 
So zircon is one of the few minerals that will, will sink all the way. Then we tweak it again, we put it through an electromagnet and hand pick it with tweezers. And finally, we get to this, a pure zircon separate. You can see the scale, this is a one millimeter across. So these are tiny, tiny grains. They're, they're, they're less than a quarter of a millimeter long. And if we're lucky, we might get about 0.1 grams. Okay, so we start with a kilogram, we end up with 0.1 gram. That's one in 10,000 grains in, in that rock is, is zircon. How do you pick them up with tweezers because they're that small? Yeah, well, we we're under, remember the microscope back over that? So yeah, we, we look down our microscope and uh, we push them around in a petri dish, sometimes in liquid. Um, and sometimes, it just sounds a bit, bit odd, but when you pull a hair out and the grease on the end of the hair, you can touch it. <laughs> and, and, and lift it up and transfer it to a, another dish or a, a slime. So there's a few, few tricks and techniques. Okay, the 2.8 is, is called sodium polytungstate that, that dissolves in water. The, the, it's the tungsten that gives it its density. And the 3.31 is methylene iodide, so that's an organic um, solvent. Yeah, and it's the iodine that gives the three iodines that gives it that density. And they're also not very viscous, so, so the grains will actually sink through them. That's another important thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we need to take precautions, particularly with methylene iodide, for the fume covers and, and that sort of thing. So the, the, there's a lot of labour because we, we, the, the, you know, we are doing it for the, the end justifies the means. <laughs> Right. There's a lot of effort involved and, and specialist and dirty, noisy equipment. Um, to go back. And you can see this is you can see the shapes of these nice little tetragonal prisms. It's a four-fold symmetry prism with um, some terminations and zircon's a very lustrous mineral because it's like diamond, it, it reflects light. So they're very if you've got other things in there, it's very easy to pick a zircon out with tweezers because it, it just kind of jumps out of it. It's, it's very pretty under a microscope. All right, so we've got our pure zircon separate. This is probably uh, well, six or eight weeks after we sent the rock up to the laboratories at headquarters. And what do we do with it then? Well, we go here. Um, um, University of Otago, it's their chemistry department. Uh, they've got some equipment in here that I'm gonna show you some pictures of. And this is where we can get, a, get an age of those zircon grains by measuring the uranium and the lead in those, each of those tiny, tiny grains. And this is something that's really only come on during my career, okay? The last 10, 15 years, uh, the technological advances in, in, in equipment have been such that we can now do this. Um, in the 1980s, we could only dream of, of, of doing this, okay? It was not done routinely. Now it is done routinely, which is a really, really nice advance to, to have witnessed. So we're in a, uh, what's called a clean laboratory. Uh, you've got to take your um, street shoes off and, and, and put some crocs on because uh, they, they can have dust and contamination in them and it's all air conditioned and uh, this is my colleague Rose Turnbull who's at the, at the keyboard doing the business and I'm going to talk to you the screens there while she's looking at and what she's doing but this is the, the main issue where we put those that little slide for the zircon we put them in there and we're firing a laser beam at them in this enclosed cabinet here and Rose is looking at these screens and she's moving with a trackball, she's moving the stage around. The trackball here is, is moving the stage in here and firing the laser and measuring. So the two of the screens she's looking at look like this. And uh, here's a mouthful for you. Um, there, there are as many acronyms in geochemistry as there are in government, okay? Um, <laughs> What we're doing is laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. <laughs> cool. So, first of all, the laser ablation. I said there's a laser in that big box there. So, what we're doing, we're firing a laser beam at, at, a, um, at 20 micron diameter laser beam at each of these grains. This, this is a TV screen showing a picture of the, the zircons. Here, the, the zircon grains in white. And the blue dots are where Rose has um, positioned the laser. She's got a trackball, just like a PlayStation, actually. Um, and and a, a video game. And you, and you hit the button, 
and then the laser fires on that. And that's the grain that you're dating. So yeah, 20, 30 micron wide laser beam for 30 seconds. And what that does is it vaporizes the zircon. So the zircon is very resistant to uh, chemical and physical attack, but a laser beam will model it. So that kind of vaporizes the zirconium and the oxygen and the uranium and the lead. It gets whisked off to a mass spectrometer which sniffs it and measures the, the amounts of those isotopes. Okay, so it measures the amount of uranium, the amount of lead. And that's what's on this screen here. And if you're close enough, you might be able to see these, these um, lines going across there, the actual amounts there. So it's very satisfying. You can see on the screen that you're, you're measuring something. The ages have to be calculated afterwards. You don't know a live age with, with a number coming up. Not, not yet, anyway. Um, this is how it's done. So 30 seconds, some downtime. So you can get through, you can analyze one grain every couple of minutes. So it's quite a good throughput, really. Um, as they said, you can with what we used to only dream about. And it's all good, it's very handy rock, is Yeah, that's what we're doing, yes. That's mm -hmm. why we're doing it. Um, you can use the laser to measure other elements in other minerals as well. It, it's, it's a technique that has wider application than just dating zircon. But mm -hmm. what I'm talking about tonight is, is it's using the in dating the zircon. You can include the bits of zircon together after you actually use the investigation of the model of the value of jewels and produce the cost of the university for that price. Well, what the <laughs> Yeah, what's 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 left is a hole it's a hole in the grain. Okay. So you're, you're actually drilling a little pit. I mean you, you can see where you analyze, and some people will go and reanalyze that later on for another set of elements or, or isotopes. So there's a certain amount of reuse here, but um, yeah, it is, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's a moderately destructive technique. Now, I wanted to show this picture. Um, this person here is an, uh, another colleague of mine, Chris Adams, and he has pioneered this use of uranium levitation of zircon in Grey Rapids in New Zealand. He's done this for dozens of samples, probably, probably below hundreds, from one end of the country to the other. So we've built up a very nice reference data set of the ages of zircon grains in Grey Rapid and Schist in New Zealand. And this is a picture of Chris at the start of his career in 1972 when he was appointed uh, to the DSIR in the laboratory doing potassium ion dating. And this is Chris today. He's an emeritus scientist with us uh, in, in Dunedin. So in, in between whiles, he's, he's bookended his career but by uh, he, he is a geochronologist, so he's dated rocks all his life by this, these radiometric methods. And the next slide is one sample of Grey Rocky that Chris has dated from up the Waitaki Valley. So this is from just east of Lake Aviemore, just up in the hills above Lake Aviemore. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's one of the rare fossil localities that we have. So we know that the, the fossils say that those Grey Rocky beds were laid down in the Permian epoch. So they're about 250 to 300 million years old is when the rocks were laid down. And this is a graph, a histogram, of the ages of the 70 zircon grains that Chris has dated from this Grey Rocky rock. Okay. So the y-axis is the number of grains he's dated. And along this axis is the age of the grains. So this is 500 million years, uh, thousand million years, or a billion years if you like, and we go all the way over to, to 2.5 billion years. So what Chris found, and this pattern is repeated the country over, is that most of the grains in this rock, 22 out of 70, are between 250 and 300 million years old. Right? So that's called the dominant peak there. And then all the other ones are older. And there's one of them, the oldest grain in this rock is 2.6 billion years old, would you believe? Okay, so it's just one grain. Okay, and there's all these other ones in between. And you can see there's an interesting, you know, you immediately you think, oh, what does all this mean? Um, so most of the zircons are the same age as the fossils. That's a nice, it's always very satisfying to see. And there's a few little clusters here. So there's a cluster between 500 and, and 700, there's another one between uh, 1,000 and, and uh, 1,200 million years, and, and so on. So 
So I'm going to keep you in suspense for a few slides, and we'll, we'll come back to this. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll interpret this with you uh, towards the end of the talk when I when I draw everything together. Just to give a bit, a bit away, what these are telling us is, is about the, the, the Gondwana history, the older history of the Grey Records. These are ages of Zircon Greys that were formed in Gondwana and then, then got brought down to form the Grey Records. But before we go there, uh, we'll go to the third part of the talk, which is about continents and supercontinents. Okay? Um, yeah, so Mandia has been on the world stage as a continent for a few years now, and we're very pleased to see it's got quite a bit of uptake and agreement and acceptance uh, among geologists and, and or just among, among YouTube as well. <laughs> all, all, all there. Um, just to remind you, continents, uh, they're, they're big things, greater than a million square kilometers, they sit high above the ocean floor. Um, they have thick crust, they've got diverse geology, you might just be very wrecky, all, all the continents have got those rocks. They've got well-defined limits or edges to them. And importantly for Zelandia, they do always include the uh, offshore like submarine shelves and things. So every continent's got all that extra pale color around the edges. So that is a bit different in that it's got a little bit of land and a lot of shelf. But it's still a legit geological continent, no, no problem. Well, going back for well, many centuries, uh, right through to the present day, most school, many school children might notice that the point of South America fits nicely into the corner of Africa on, on a world map. All right? So the, the, today's continents that are scattered all over the Earth's surface, um, there's a hint that they might have packed together a bit more closely in, in the very distant geological past. And this is in fact the case. Um, here's a jigsaw puzzle. I brought it along tonight. <laughs> of um, a wooden jigsaw puzzle of Gondwan. So a supercontinent is going to be a big continent with, with lots of continents stuck together. And since the time of Gondwana, they've, they've split up and broken apart by plate tectonic things. And I'll show you a movie in a minute of that breakup process. A couple of people that deserve some credit for actually figuring out the fit of the continents in, in a geological way rather than just a geometric way are Alfred Wegener and Alexander Dutoy. Okay, Wegener uh, was a Norwegian meteorologist, he wasn't a geologist. He was the first person to come up with this the name Pangaea for a, a, a global supercontinent by, by not just fitting the Africa into South America, but by looking at the geology of different things and seeing that there was a match across these lines. And the toy, we have to thank for, well, he didn't come up with the ratio in one but I mean, he drew these maps of, of, of two other supercontinents at a, a diff different geological time from Pangaea. This is a famous picture of Beckler, it's on Wikipedia and the like. Um, I think he's, he's looking a bit impatient <laughs> with, with the geologists and not accepting his uh, continental drift theory uh, back in the 1910s. It took another half century before it was, was properly accepted. But he was, he was vindicated. And so this is a, a geological map of Gondwana. You can see it's got far more colours than the map of the Waitaki Valley I showed you earlier on. But this gives us confidence that yeah, the, the, the different colours between South America and Africa match when you look them up in the same go to India, Antarctica, Australia. And his good old New Zealand down here, floating off in the south part there. So for many decades, geologists would go to conferences every few years and discuss the findings and try and refine the match of these uh, geological units across there. And so they jiggle around the jigsaw with have a slightly different fit at different times. So the question was just how do these things tuck back together? Well, again, the technical and scientific advances being what they are, since about the mid-1990s, there's been no question of this whatsoever. Because we, we know the exact lines of fit of continents, ironically, from the oceans. Right. So remember, the oceans have opened up in between the continents as the continents have spread apart. And you can see these lines, these kind of fabric lines through the Atlantic here, these are the best ones, but also the, the Indian Ocean. These are fracture zones, these are fault lines, 
and they show the exact points at which the, the continents spread apart from each other, which is immensely satisfying to have this kind of data set. And um, it's only since we've had satellites measuring gravity that we've got the detailed maps of the ocean floor. So again, prior to 1995 at least, uh, we did not have this clear view of, of, of global geology. But now we do, so it's taken away all the, all the uncertainty. And particularly, it's taken away the uncertainty for Zelandia. Where, where, where do we put Zelandia back in Gondwana? That, that map I showed earlier on just had the, the islands kind of flapping around at the bottom in a rather unsatisfactory way. Well, we can do a lot better. Uh, this map on the left is the situation today. Um, the, the Zelandia outline is in the, the pale brown colour, North Island, South Island. And these black lines are the fault zones in, in the Southern Ocean that we link back to Antarctica. And in the Tasman Sea that we link back to Australia. And here's the ones that link Antarctica and Australia down here. So if we kind of rewind the clock back to when they're all together, we have the picture on the, the right there. And we can check this because uh, the next slide is going to show you a picture of three granites that occur, one, one in Australia at Noosa Heads, one on the south and coast of Riverton, and one in Pine Island Bay in Antarctica. Okay, you can see at present day they're all scattered, the red dots are scattered apart a lot. Um, if we make that point into reconstruction, they all join up in a, a fairly simple line. In fact, if we go, go to these places, the, the age of the granite is exactly the same, and other geochemical and isotopic measurements are the same as well. So there's good reason to, to correlate these granites. They're, they're the same age in all the places. So that's a kind of a cross-check, if you like, on, on the ocean movement. And again, it's a very satisfying thing to have a different data set to agree. Right, moving on the quickly, the next two slides, so we're getting towards the end of the talk now, the next two slides are animations, okay? The first one is an animation of starting in this 200 million years ago and then going forward to the present day. So we're at 200 million years at the moment in the Triassic, so the same age as the Grobekis in the, in the Waitaki here. We are here, <laughs> right down at the South Pole. It's unfortunate that most, so what we're going to see is this is the supercontinent of Pangaea, all right, in the orange and the yellow and the red. This is when all of the Earth's continental continents were together in one big supercontinent, just one big supercontinent. And the, um, therefore, going around the back of it, there's, it's all, all ocean around there. And so the supercontinent was called Pangaea, the super ocean is called Panthalassa, mm -hmm. all right. So I'm going to hit the play button, and you're going to see this um, count down, like a stopwatch, and you're going to see these continents break up and split up. It's unfortunate that m most of these are produced by Northern Hemisphere geologists, so we see them in Australia, they're jammed way down at the bottom there, but the next, the next movie is a bit different, all right? So I'll, I'll just run for 30 seconds or so. You can see that Gondwana and Laurasia are starting to break apart here into two supercontinents. And also a bit of spreading in India starting to get on the move here. And the South Atlantic's opening up. So we're starting to get towards something a bit more familiar looking for the present day. So the black lines are the spreading ridges where things move apart, the purple lines are where things subduction where the uh, crust can, can dive down. So there we are. Gone from uh, Pangaea to present day in 30 seconds. Now, this is a similar movie, except the colours are all different. Sorry, I, I, I can make these of this just come from, from colleagues. Confidence are grey here now, and we're starting again at 200 million years, but we've got a South Pole view instead, right? Which is a lot better for us, right? This white dot is where we are, the, the, uh, the Waitaki Valley, and this is the North Island and South Island. Zelandia is going to end up at the bottom here, up, upside down if you like, but you, you'll be able to track it and see what happens, all right? And all the garish colours are different ages of ocean crust. 
Um, not quite how I'd colour it for the purposes of today's talk, but there you go. So here we have a supercontinent of Gondwana, Australia, Antarctica, Africa, South America, and, and Zealandia along here. All, um, so again, starting at 200 million years, and we'll go forward in time again. And so, first of all, back in the Triassic, uh, Zelandia, the white tackle is almost right at the South Pole. How about that? Mm -hmm. So, 187, 185, okay, so Gondwana is just sort of moving around like this now. Not much happening. 150 million years. There's some breakup occurring here. 120. The oceans are breaking up some more. Zealandia is still glued to Australia and Antarctica. Uh, 85 is our magic one here. Bang! This is where Zealandia starts to break off and form a continent on its own. All these other ridges are still busy spreading. Australia is getting in the way. And Antarctica, they're heading towards the equator. And zero. Here we are today. This is the present day situation. So here we are, Zelandia upside down, <laughs> North Island, South Island. So we've come a long way from the South Pole. We started off there, right? And now we're at 45 south. So there's the immense amount of geological information and the geophysical information goes into these, but they're, 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 they're lovely animations. Right, so the last few slides, how do we bring this together from what we can see with our eyes up, up the valley to that zircon dating I told you about? What about that uh, 2.6 billion year old zircon in the, in the, in the grey wet Okay, and what does that tell us about continents and supercontinents? How can we make sense of these three very different sort of observation, scales of observation? Here we are with Bonvira again. Permian, it's a little bit older, but not much has changed. Here's the South Pole. You can see the outline of Australia, Antarctica, India, and we've smeared Zealandia against the side there, and here we are. Okay, this is where we tuck, tuck back in to, to Gondwana. More comes on this map. These, these are the results of immense amounts of work over the decades by geologists on all the continents. And they're color coded from sort of a hot red. Zircon age is a, a young zircon age, 203 million year old. Zircons occur in these red areas in Queensland and a bit area uh, uh, a bit down in Antarctica here. 350 to 400 million year old zircons are in orange. New South Wales, Victoria, a bit of Antarctica here, here. The oldest zircons have magic number 2.6 billion years old, occur in the black areas. Go go a long way to find those. We're Western Australia and India. Okay, these are called cratons, uh, for those of know the term. So, this is a, a, a geological map that shows the area of the age of zircons in, in, in Gondwana. So, I'll add in that graph, that histogram graph again, but I've covered it up in the same way as this. All right. And Somewhat unsatisfactory, and then leave you hanging because it's, it's a topic of current debate as to what these correlations mean. It's reasonable to infer that all of the red zircons, the young ones, came from these red areas here, all right? Go fed by rivers coming down to the part here. If this was in the same place, all right, it may have been deposited in a different place and then brought by the fake atomics to there. Likewise, if you want to find where these green 500 to 700 million years zircons came from, then we have to go shopping in these green areas here, all right, and so on. And the, the, old, the further back in time you go, the fewer there are, and, and the further away you've got to go. So it's a matter of debate as to whether, uh, among my colleagues, as to whether the, the tallest river has always been here, and you have very different rivers meandering across this, for thousands of kilometers across the supercontinent, that bring this very diverse set of ages to this point, or if you're better off putting New Zealand and Permian up here and trying to do it with a more limited river system. Obviously, you can't get all the big answers from one sample, right? It just that's not fair. But um, yeah, these are the sorts of um, issues and problems, hopefully, with the eventual answers that are mulled over by, by my colleagues now. 
Well, why are you, are you assuming the Zircons can be grass? Yeah, because, uh, okay, good, good point. So the Zircon is a mineral that crystallizes in the magma. That, that's how they always form first. But good point. They, they can actually then be eroded from the ground and get locked up in a sedimentary rock and stay there. So this, this Zircon might have kind of it could have been eroded from the ground, been, uh, been deposited in a sedimentary rock for thousands of years old, stayed there, that may have a, a wider distribution. And then that may have been eroded and re-released. So this is partly why the picture is very complicated. We can't assume that they're all just come straight away from these places. They may have stopped on the way. And of course, places like Antarctica is covered in ice, so there's not much. We, we were, and then Australia is covered in desert. With no rocks, so there's always going to be some speculation. Nonetheless, this Zircon data opened up this, this approach and allowed us to, to think of problems like this, and, and it's been a, been a very good tool. Is Zircon, zircon the only um, uh, means that you've got of dating things, or are there any other substances that you can use? Yep, no, there's, there's plenty of other minerals, yeah. Zircon is the most useful because it's so physically and chemically resistant. But you can do it with a whole range of other minerals. Unfortunately, you can't always apply every radiometric data to every mineral. Like, like quartz, for example, we, we can't date quartz in, in the same way yet. Um, Feldspars are a bit tricky, but um, yeah, there's, a, there's other, other tools available, other minerals and other, other systems to build a bigger picture. Sorry, you. Oh, earrings, okay, yeah, well, they, um... Yeah, no, I would say zircon is a very lustrous mineral, so yeah, I guess that's why it's apparently the gemstone and it takes a nice cut and polish. So, yeah, we could probably read this, yeah. We can talk more about gemstones in, in, in a couple of minutes, if you general questions, if you like, I'll, I'll come back to something there. But just wrap, wrapping up. Really. Um, so, Permian Gondwana, the, the picture I showed you before, of um, what sort of rivers or glaciers can we postulate to, to bring those old zircons in, into one place where they get mixed up together? Um, possibly it's not unlike some of the landscapes we have around on Earth today. Um, Grainy rivers, erasing old zircons from mountains or, or, or glaciated areas as well. So, Remember, where we started off is loose sand in the river, and um, we get to extract one in 10,000 grains of what we're chasing with the zircons to get this, this story. And the last slide. So, uh, yeah, hopefully you found tonight interesting. Uh, if you haven't found it interesting, hopefully you at least enjoyed the maps and pictures <laughs> and stories. Um, and you'll go away with um, that there is a lot of growing interest in the White Up Geo Park to go and see. And you can see some really interesting things in the bedding, grading, the joint fractures, the difference between the two. Uh, it's all there to see. We can tell a lot more if we then take the growing into the laboratory. And, and I'll just, just focus on this, this one specific example of zircon data and, and the power of that technique and the effort we have to go to, 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 to get that information. Uh, as background, we know that the continents join together as supercontinents, Pangaea and Gondwana, and we know their geology fairly well. And this allows us a nice kind of template on which to interpret the, the zircon elements. And that's kind of where the science is at right now. Okay, now we don't have all the answers. We can't draw big rivers going across Gondwana in the way that we'd like to, but at least we're thinking about the possibility. So, even in your own backyard, there's cutting edge science going on, and um, hopefully you can go out and see this yourself, and remember this scale diagram too, that um, you know, there's, what you see in the Waitaki Valley is part of a big national picture of a growing schist, and you know, even the global picture of supercontinents, uh, but in order to get that, you have to go down to the atom level to, to do this work. 
So thanks very much. Size of the sand grains, okay. 
there are zircons in argillites and mudstones, but they're much, much smaller and much harder to separate and much harder to pick between. It's impossible to pick the tweezers, but you, you, you can see them. And so that's another way you can actually understand that, um, yeah, gravity turns into a schist and argillite turns into a schist as well. It's by the size of the zircon, which always stays around. If I pass your degree at the start, you see that the very way you see the victory block. So presumably, it's pretty comfortable not having heat, but there's some other heavy stuff on top, squeezing it, not doing it at the same start. Yep. But it's just as you say, it's layered with more. So how does that work? I mean, is that the same thing as a different raw material, or are you in or what's All right, so actually, same as raw material, but different pressure. So you get the same volume of crust, if you like, but uh, the schist has been down deeper in, oh. the, in the subduction zone. In fact, the main... So uh, just more of them. That's right. The, the main question or the main research question with the schist is how, how do we get it up to the surface again that we can see it? Right? Because it forms 20 kilometres deep, and yet here it is at the surface today. Um, and that, that's a whole other talk and, and spec uh, speculations, but it's just as interesting. One of the quick I thought, you know, that I had years ago and filled with dinosaurs. I have not the impression that contributing to that is the fact that India collided with Asia and forced the Himalayas. And the animation seemed to show India relying on about 30 million years ago, not 65. Oh, well, it's possible. Okay. <laughs> um, now, I've just shown one, I've just plucked one animation out of many. And different research groups would have different opinions about the, the timing of the collision of India with Asia. Okay, mm -hmm. so diff different movies all have different times. In terms of the uh, Chicxulub um, impact crater, uh, in a way that's that's noise to the plate tectonics engine. The internal engine of the Earth is churning away all the while, inexorably. Okay, uh, the Chicxulub, for all the extinction, mass extinction it, it, it caused. Uh, it was just a purely superficial event, just a blink, blink of the eye, really. So it has, has no real bearing on. I mean, if, if it was, if it was a, you know, a hundred times larger, it, it, it might have some effect on, on the plate tectonics, but, but it, it didn't. It had a big effect on the atmosphere, mm -hmm. but, but not on not on the solid earth. May I ask? A, a, it might be a silly question. It's to do with some research in that. Um, Three hundred. Thousand years ago, I know that's a short time. How, like today, was the planet, the continents on the planet, 300,000 years ago? Yeah, well, you're right. You're right to say that 300,000 years ago is, is not long geologically. Mm -hmm. So you, the answer to your question is not very much. Mm -hmm. I think it would be one frame in those movies, perhaps. Right. Uh, so, less, so than a million, you know, less than a million years. Very much looking the same as today. Yes, that's right. The, the, the variation might be 300,000 or even somewhere in the ice ages. Mm -hmm. So sea levels would be higher or lower, all the same. So geographically, there might be some differences, but geologically, tectonic plates, continents, mm -hmm. very, very similar to today. Thank you. Yeah. So, would you just like to um, send another thanks to that? And